Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are calling in from uh, for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Mark Burson. I'm the chair, chairman of the ASQ Government Institute, and we are here for the webinar entitled Lean Communication. Les is more, and Larry Edwards is speaking today. So I have a few more things to, to introduce uh, and talk to you about. So today's webinar is brought to you by the American Society for Quality, ASQ, and the ASQ Government Division. And again, I will be moderating today's webinar. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Government Division. So uh, ASQ is rep represents the voice of quality throughout the world with over 80,000 members. Find us on ASQ.org. The government division is one out of 26 divisions in the society. Uh, the government division is a community of practitioners focused on quality and performance improvement for federal, state, local, and international governments. We are composed of government leaders and employees, seasoned experts, consultants, practitioners, university professors, students, and others engaged with or interested in the public sector. So we certainly would hope that you join our community at some point and check us out on our website, on the Government Division website. Um, a couple of uh, little bit more information on some upcoming webinars. We have uh, one coming up in October, October 8th. Uh, we typically have a webinar once a month, typically the first, uh, first second Tuesday out of every month. The next one that's coming up is called 8D Discipline, Applying This Problem Solving Technique in Government by David Eisenberg. And you can go to the Government Division website to learn more about it and to register for uh, this event and, and any others that are being announced. And we'll be announced in more webinars as they come up. So for today, use the Q&A tab to send in any questions you have during the webinar. Uh, at the end of the session today, We'll address as many questions as we can. Um, I'll present those questions to Larry, and uh, we'll answer as many as we can possibly answer. Um, at the end of the presentation, there is a list of contact information for the government division officers, as well as uh, the speaker, which again is Larry Edwards. Um, most of the presentation, most of, the, of our presentations for webinars are available for download within a few days of the webinar being presented. Uh, and so, without further ado, I have a great pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Larry Edwards. But let me let me go through a little bit of a, a little bit more information about who Larry is. Larry Edwards is passionate about continuous improvement in all areas of life, personal and over the past, past 20 years, Larry has implemented process and performance improvement through applied inspection of quality in both products and services across industries to include military, software development, healthcare, retail, financial services, and local government. He describes himself as a serial innovations engineer, seeking always to make a positive, real world impact in both business and communal environment. Um, Logan Moore is uh, there. He serves as an officer in the government division, and he is also the section chair for ASQ Charlotte. So, without further ado, I'd like to present to you Larry and uh, turn it over to him. Thank you very much, Larry. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. It's been a blessing to be able to do this presentation. It is entitled Lean for Communications, Less is More. If you've ever been in a conversation that was seeming not to hit the point but taking a lot of time, this is for you. 
Uh, if you've been in more meetings than you care to be, where the valuable the value of being there is perishing, this is for you. If you just like to know a little bit more about the discipline of lean, this is for you. And if you just like to know a little bit more about communication and how we do it, this is for you. If you haven't caught the undertones of this webinar, it's for you. So a few items that we're going to go over as an agenda high level um, is some show-stopping stats. I always like to, where I can, be able to um, back up the design of a presentation or information being delivered by the numbers. And in this particular pre presentation, we have some pretty interesting numbers that come from some experts from all around the country, universities, that tell us a little bit more about our communications, the value of our communication in time, in dollars, and other numbers. Um, and in that, I want to go to point number two is we need to talk. And sometimes the, the response to that is, do we, do we actually need to talk? Or could this be handled a different way? But we're going to go over some things that we need to talk about. Number three, for those who have been practitioners of lean as a methodology, some of this is, is uh, going to be a back to the basics, but I want you to enjoy this. I want you to lean back and really dig into the presentation and pull, pull out things that you can find valuable in your workplaces. What really makes a difference is those things that could be valuable where you work, where you live. So we're going to go ahead and get to the last bullet there and line up and let's go. But the line up and let's go is after we've completed the presentation, some of the information to take with you and maybe try to apply or even share this webinar, share some information from this, and you might get a few, uh, get a lot of agreement around um, some situation that arises through how we communicate and trying to imp trying to transmit information and get to the point with your colleagues and leaders. And if everyone's aligned, then we can make some changes. So before we get started, uh, I have a few words of wisdom from, uh, or actually two words of wisdom from uh, two gentlemen of high and well renown. Now. Some of you guys who've been walking in the quality journey for some time might recognize this, this gentleman here. And this is Dr. Stephen Covey. You might know him from books like Seven, Highly, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, um, Seven, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teams. And one of the words of wisdom that, that dropped into my spirit years ago and still with me with this is that you want to begin with the end in mind. Now, a lot of times we think about that as product design, and it is true there, but ultimately is goals. And in communication, you communicate most of the time with a purpose, with an intent, with an expectation of outcome. So begin with the end in mind. The second gentleman here, um, for those who might not know, is Mr. John Wooden, and he was the Long-time championship UCLA basketball coach, 12-time uh, division champions or you know NAACP champions um, for you know in in uh, university University of California um, UCLA, and he and I this also stuck in my spirit. He's like, if you don't have time to do it right, when will you have time to do it? again or over. Now, that is a piece of wisdom that I walk through every day in the line of work that I do as a internal consultant doing process improvement. Some of the biggest frustrations are born from the need to do something, touch something more than once, to redo something. And it's no different in our forms of communication. I don't know how many people actually like to repeat themselves after think thoughtfully delivering uh, a point or a series of points or some objectives or intent, whether it be written, verbal, or otherwise, we want to do it right the first time, and we want to be received right the first time so that at least our engagements are conclusive. So today's world, some of you might be familiar with this, this particular adage here uh, from I Love Lucy. In today's world, it probably feels a little bit like that. This isn't a video, but what you see here is 
The conveyor belt was pushing chocolates down an assembly line, and as it sped up and got more and more and more, it became faster and faster and faster, and our ability to keep up, or in this instance, Lucy's ability to keep up with the chocolates, often kind of simulates with our ability to keep up with the distribution of information. If you roll the clock back 20 years ago, there was only a certain handful of ways of actually being able to communicate um, reporting information, intent or otherwise. It was gen generally in person. It was by letter or some sort of physical document publication. It was by phone call. Now, of course, there was other things. You could have, you know, I guess you could still have used the, um, where you, you kind of tap things out. Um, the, the radio transmissions from the Second World War, I can't remember the name of that right now. But um, telegrams, you know, you could have used telegrams. Um, and actually, nowadays, being as 2019, you did have, you know, uh, email and some, some, some more rudimentary um, technologies that are much more advanced in, in our time. But now, it's coming a whole lot faster, you know, and it seems to be speeding up. The variety of channels seem to be diversifying. There's more and more apps to do more and more things with special features. And our communication or our way of communicating is starting to simulate slinging chocolates down that conveyor belt faster and faster to where at some point we're going to drop and we're going to shove chocolates in our mouths and say, yes, I got the point. But you do come equipped to communicate as a human being. You have your senses, but are you ready to communicate? Just because you are equipped to does not mean that you're ready to do so. So here's the first one. We communicate by what we see, and that's a big, big part of how we communicate because a big portion of how we communicate is nonverbal, is what we see. Now, the big part that we often practice, so myself, I am... Uh, not only consultant, but uh, part of that, over the years, I've been a member of Toastmasters for 13 years. So speaking is a big part of how we communicate in a more intimate setting, one-to-one -one, or even with mass audience. What we say vocally. Huge underrated component of how we come equipped to communicate is listening. It is one thing to see what someone says or see them express themselves. It's another thing to hear the spoken language. It is an altogether different thing to listen. And some of the ways we've been taught to listen um, don't necessarily hold up the best way. Some of what we have called active listening has also been recently termed active impairment. We've learned to listen in ways that may not help filter information the best way, but we do come equipped with the ability to listen. And let's be honest, who does who hates a good listener? We all want to be heard. We all want to be understood. And a lot of that comes with that sense, starting with that sense, is listening. Now I'm going to go ahead and bypass these other forms of communicate uh, of what we come equipped to engage the world with. Um, so there will be no smelling. There will be none of the other stuff. Um, you know, if you happen to fall into that bucket, go ahead and give me a call. Larry Edwards and Associates will gratefully provide you some risk mitigation services to help get you through. But I'd rather not get that call, so let's just stay where we're at. So I'm a big believer in definition of terms. I don't like to assume that we are all same paging. If you go into different businesses, units of business, uh, different product lines, different services, the world is full of their own acronyms, their own meanings. So what you may mean about one term is different than using the exact same term, different environment. So I like to start with a definition of communication. And oddly enough, <laughs> to find the definition of communication, it varies, mixes, and range. So I kind of pull together what I thought the most accurate parts to represent what we were, will be discussing about leaning up our communications into this definition. And it, I have it defined as a process by which information is exchanged between individuals through a common system or set 
of practices. If, the, if your system of, of practices in your system being used are not common between the, the person or people sending a piece of communication and receiving, if it is dissimilar, disassociated, disaggregated, it doesn't actually count as communication. It really kind of turns into just making noise. So before you schedule your next meeting, I like to hit you with a few big numbers here. As we walk the triangle here, or walk some of these statistics, what we'll see is that, uh, and I'm gonna hit you with a big number first, uh, UNC professor, University of North Carolina professor, Charlotte, um, Stephen Rogelberg um, presented some information late last year, and I just so happen to be tracking on something similar at the time, um, but he presented that through a series of surveys and studies that in the United States, we spend $1.4 trillion annually on the direct cost of producing meetings. Now, when I say direct cost, that means to actually hold the space, apply the applications, um, the heat, cool, maybe even food, $1.4 trillion annually. Now, let's back up to some of these other numbers. There are 55 million meetings being conducted every day. And that basically adds up to about 11 weeks annually being spent in meetings per year for middle managers and up. 69% of meetings are regularly interrupted. So I'm prayerful that in our time together, that in this one hour, that we don't fall into that 69%, but we get lucky with 31% and nothing interrupts our meeting. But when meetings are interrupted, it takes a minute to reset. 59% of employees are less engaged just due to the number of meetings. Think about that. 59% of people, if you had less meetings, they would be more engaged. 130% is the number of, uh, uh, is the increase of meetings in volume that we've had since the 1960s. So as we advance in technology, Sakami grew, we became, became more of a meeting culture. And that kind of started all the way back when meetings were expressed as the original productivity tool. And in a lot of ways they can be, in some ways they could distract from productivity. 25% of your employees are easily distracted. You think about that, if you have four people on average in one meeting, one of them is going to kind of float off to the left or to the right periodically. And it's not really their fault, we will get to some of that, but you're, you're losing some productivity just in that. And you tag that with the number of meetings, even more. Only 17% of your senior executives report that meetings are a good use of their time. 17% of those senior executives say this is a good use of, how, what um, in anywhere else, in anything else, if you only had 17% 17 support and you had essentially 83% or somewhere in the neighborhood that disapproved, it would not be happening. Yet we are so conditioned to the, the, the world of meetings that we allow 17% to overtake our schedules to the point of $1.4 trillion a year. Our 62% of meeting, uh, meetings miss the opportunity to actually bring teams closer together. We have to work better on making team dynamics there. 64% of meetings come down or come at the expense of deep thinking. And in today's knowledge economy, you need time, space, and often a little bit of quiet to get into what they call flow. Well, 64% believe that we're disrupting flow with the meetings that we're having. And 65% of the meetings keep, um, keep them from completing their work, and them being employees can keep them from completing their work. I'll use an example from not too long ago. I had, and it's needful, but I had um, my regular business meetings, then I had a day that I had to kind of book off for internal team meetings, good team development, but then I had another two days for two different trainings, and to that point of flow, 
is although I'm getting some good training, although we're developing strong team structures, if you ask me about the flow of a couple of projects in flight, I, it took a while to reset to get back to the productivity just because of other meetings, most of which I found valuable on one level, but it's not always going to be the case. So I would warn you to be aware of Parkinson's law because work does expand, or at least Parkinson's law says that. You tell me if you think it's true. Work will expand as far as it needs to to fill the available time for the completion. So if you have a meeting that's an hour, scheduled for an hour, the the agenda, whether it's supported or not in writing, will expand to fill that one hour. And so will me. And I believe here we have, you know, I have, may I have your attendance of, of, of attention. And quickly, there is the, if you have the time available, you will actually have a lot of meetings put in the place unless you put controls in the place. So this slide here is, may I have your attention please? We have a whole lot that's working against us in the ability to actually have attention deep enough to not schedule these meetings so that we don't have to pay attention. So a few things are, 55% uh, of our time is spent listening. 75% of our time is spent communicating. So we're talking more than we're actually listening. 85% um, of our leaders, their senior leaders, spend their time communicating and 10% planning communications. But I'm going to jump over to a couple of big numbers that I had researched here. There's a gap between our ability to listen and the speed of which verbal conversations is coming. The average person only speaks about 125 to 150 words per minute. But we can interpret up to 450 words per minute. So there's a gap of about 75% between how fast conversation is going and what we can interpret. And I think that is one of those things that leads us to the idea of multitasking. Um, it splits our attention, and we only have a shortened attention span from what it once was. So in the year 2000, we had a 12-second attention span before something else is going to capture our attention. And as of May 2015, the research has shown that our attention span has dropped by 25%, down to 8 seconds. So our attention span is shortened severely. And one of the things that you can think about is what has intervened since the year 2000, essentially up to today's timeline. A lot has intervened. Social media, email is easier to, to do. Um, our phones have become multi-purpose. So sitting in front of me right now, my phone has badges, so there's little red circles on emails, on reminders, et cetera, things that are competing for our attention that keep us from the maximum value that we can, we can have. And one of the things I want to point out, and I point this out with young folks when I discuss with them about communications, is that two days from now, unless you actually download the webinar, so please do, Two days from now, you're only going to remember about 75, may, or 17, maybe 25% of what you just heard. Only 17 to 25%. So this, this is really going to kind of hopefully help key you in. Some other forms of communication is listening, reading, and writing. And your ability to retain is about 40, 45%, 16% and 9% respect, respectively. So one more thing. Every 15 seconds that you're interrupted, research shows it takes you about 24 minutes just to get back on track. 
So every time someone calls your name, every time uh, the badge comes up, the reminders, the pings, the, all that, take you away for 15 seconds, cost you 24 minutes. And due to the overall volume of disruptions that we have, we lose on average about 6.2 hours per day in productivity loss. So that's 31 weeks of the year. Once again, there's only 52 weeks in a year. You back out a couple for vacation and holidays, you're down to about 13 productive weeks out of 52. And it's got, it comes at a cost. 28 billion hours per year are wasted or lost. So what do we do? Well, let's first start with the culture. And the culture carries the communication capacity. There's a lot that goes into the culture. It's a specific set of competencies that you need to deliver your core services and how you are structured to deliver that with your partners within your teams. Some elements of your culture are authority. Do you have the authority to change the communications mode? Do you have the time to change communications mode? How complex is the message that needs to be relayed? The more complex it is, the probably more interpersonal it needs to be. The more direct it is, the more simple it can be. This morning I was sending an email out um, that I needed some reimbursement for some travel and training. And the communication was an email because it was very direct. Point one, point two, point three, and point four need to be accomplished. Something need to be printed, something need to be signed, something need to be addressed, and something need to be delivered. It wasn't very complex. Now, if we were doing this presentation, it wouldn't go very well if it was on email, right? And make sure that the language that you're using in your, your culture actually matches the outcomes you're looking for. It's easy sometimes as subject matter experts to use language that is somewhat or slightly beyond the audience that you're speaking to. We often speak in acronyms. When I was in the military, we spoke in acronyms. When I was in IT, we spoke in acronyms. Financial services, acronyms. Government, acronyms. But everybody's not in on your acronym game. So we got to watch our language that we're proliferating in the culture, make sure that everybody's on the same page. And when I was discussing email, it's part of the format. There's multiple formats that you can be used to do out your, your co corporate culture or personal to actually get your point across. One example that I have for that is I have uh, brothers, and then I've got some friends and family, and some people will respond to a phone call. They'll never respond to a text. And I'm sure each of you has something. Some people respond to an email, but will never pick up that phone. So use the format that's most useful for the audience that you're communicating with. And then a vision. Make sure that we're aligned. We're, we're working towards the a same goal, a common goal, and common outcomes. Like what constitutes a win? for both of us. So here we go. We've got some communication mixes here. And effectiveness and efficiency are each modes that are dependent on the sender and receiver and the format for what you do it. As we've got here, we've got more interpersonal um, the scale where I'm going from green down to red is more rich format when it's in person, one to one. There's no distractions. In the group, still rich format uh, because we can collaborate. Now it's going to up the cost and and up some of the complexity, but you have that. Written requires you to focus, and, and that's good. Telepresence is a good one. Uh, for, so we're doing telepresence right now. We can communicate back and forth. And then social media allows you to communicate a lot 
but it's in text, so you don't get the modes of expression that come from people. So they're, the way they're looking, the way they're responding, are their arms folded, are they engaged? So the higher the context or contact communication, uh, the deeper the context and contextualization you'll get out of it. The lower leads to a potential for more misunderstanding. And the scale in reverse here, low contact communications can be very rich in information. It allows you to go back and revisit what was communicated, but it's also time delayed. It can be context devoid. It might require some extra ex explanation. And so it's just something as simple as an LOL. Was that actually a laugh out loud or was that like, okay, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. So a few common constraints to effective communication. I don't know how many of you actually feel like sometimes you're screaming up the side of a mountain to get through the bureaucracy. And effective lean communication, you know, uh, often challenging at one level and much less at others. And some of the infrastructure you have here is that starting from the base is practices and processes. This is where the people live. So your subject matter experts, uh, friends and family even. This is where the action's actually happening. Performance. Is the practice and processes tied to any performance or, or metrics or measures to kind of help cultivate that culture and encourage a standard practice? Permission is a big one. I just took a class, Speed of Trust. And if I boiled it all down, a lot of it's about the permission to communicate. What you can communicate and to whom you can communicate, under what conditions. And then there's policy at the top of the pyramid. If there's a policy that guides or reinforces certain practices, that could be a positive, it could be a barrier. So oftentimes our communications, we're, we're trying to deliver a message through all these different layers and we're pushing information up the mountain instead of effectively pulling it through to the audiences that should or need to participate. So there comes an accumulation of costs, both indirect costs and direct costs. So the direct cost, as we spoke about, is the cost that is directly attributable to your communication modes that you're using. So in-person meetings require space. Generally, it requires lighting. Uh, today, In today's world, it requires technology and equipment to facilitate that technology, uh, heating, cooling, et cetera. Indirect costs are those costs which might be direct to some, is your time, gas, yes, movement. And then all of it boils down to opportunity cost. So in the opportunity cost realm, what was the reasonable next alternative that you could have used that same time and space for should you use the different format and look to try to lean up the communication process? So the first part I was talking about is your team selection. Who is involved in your meetings? It's the first proactive step that you can take in right-sizing or leaning up your actions when you're communicating. And there's a model uh, known as KESA where you can start looking at your participants so that you don't waste anyone else's time um, or frustrate the process. But kind of really sets out who's participating and who needs to participate in, in the conversation, in the project, and for how long. So the first barrier is knowledge. Does your participant have the appropriate knowledge to participate in the conversation, the communication mix and mode? If I try to leverage a tool like Skype for business network, 
it's going to generally require some training. Yeah, so the knowledge might not be there to actually participate with certain audiences in that realm. So we have to work hard to get that information to them. Experience. Now, the experience, how long does this knowledge uh, need to be acquired for? We all have multiple things that we, we need to do. And that becomes a competition space so, because some certain people have an ex, uh, experience that you need, but it can also create bottlenecks in your process because there's probably not a whole lot of them. And there's a lot of people pulling in a lot of different directions. Skills. So skills can come down to tools or specific techniques. So take project management or process improvement or performance improvement, inspection, et cetera. What skills do you need to have represented to, to find success? And even if you have the knowledge, the experience, the skills, how many of us run into the wrong attitudes, right? They just don't want to play. Um, so monitoring the attitude could make a lot of difference in success or something a little less than success when selecting your team and mistake proofing the project implementation. And then aptitude. You might have all the others. You have the knowledge, the experience, the skill, the right attitude. But what about when things change? Technology change. Maybe the technology change requires you to learn something new. Does the, the team selected or the members of the team and the management of that team do they have the right aptitude to properly contribute? Nobody wants to make a bad contribution. But if you don't have the aptitude or there's not a plan to, to move you towards that aptitude, there's going to be a lot of frustration. So team selection is very important to, for implementing uh, uh, a successful project. And a lot of times it's just kind of based on availability. Who's available? That doesn't necessarily help you. So I use a little framework for onboarding people to projects and programs because how many times are we kind of trapped in this cycle of we were selected to be a part of a team, to be a part of an initiative, to be part of a project, and you fulfilled your task, but you're still being invited to meetings. You're still being required to attend these meetings. So I created a little framework or model, and I call it open, <laughs> to allow people to speak back under these different categories on projects that I work on to let me know, like, where is your value contribution at? So the first one is I have is open, and start with the O. Is my contribution obsolete? Have I completed the task that I was assigned to do that's going to contribute value. Sometimes we're just kind of languishing like those, and it's like, I don't know why I'm still here. And we need to be able to get that feedback from our participants. The second one is perishing. I'm not done yet, but the event horizon is coming, and I need to signal that either for task completion, value creation, or maybe even just availability. My time is coming. My contributions are going to be dwindling, dwindling down, and it be, it's time to move on and be offboarded. And then sometimes there's just entanglements. So that's the E. The entanglements represent indecision in place or scope creep where you make a contribution and you just kind of get pulled over as a team member, as a leader, into side ops, other initiatives. Or you could just be the security blanket for the team or leadership of that team, even though your contribution is starting to get gray and a little bit undefined and we're just going to find a spot for you. So at the end, it's time with the end to do negotiations. 
So how do I get out of this? Or maybe not get out of it, but let's begin with the end in mind. Let's negotiate the, the go for it. Maybe I don't need to be on every status call. Maybe I only need to be on a certain product status call and to a defined point. But those need to be negotiated. And in order to negotiate those, or even to implement any part of the open framework, you need to be in constant communication and not just assume that because someone was selected and brought on the team and assigned some tasks, that they don't leave until the whole thing is done. When their contribution is complete, then let them be complete. So I was talking about when to use the open framework to drive clear value-added contribution and align it to the demand of the work schedule. Uh, the participation governance is seeing the forest for the trees. Sometimes we can't see the forest for the trees, we're busy. But we need to pull back and see these highlighted trees is this person and their contribution know when to bring them on, what they're going to be contributing, what the value of that contribution is going to be, and when to let them off. And it pairs up well with the CASA model for the knowledge, experience, skill, attitude, and aptitude. So I have a little diagram where I apply the open framework from when you onboard, and you should onboard people to initiatives and projects. When you onboard them, you bring them on because they have a special talent that will provide value in a time box and be clear about what goals you're trying to accomplish. In the second step, you align that acquired talent to specific timelines and deliverables, and you create a culture of people who are coming on, who are aware of their part of the, their share of the task, what the expectations are, and what the performance actions are going to be looked for coming forward out of that. So in step three, let them loose. Start them, deploy. Let them start contributing the value for which you brought them on for, along with the prescribed timelines. And in step four, good job, and now goodbye. Off for them. Give them some feedback. Let them know how they, well they contributed. And if there's any initiatives that are on the horizon where they might be used again, or they might have learned some new skills that can be contributed from one project to another. Leverage. So a good deal of you guys know about Lean. And the Lean is essentially a methodology that's designed around eliminating or reducing waste and creating value. So it's important to define those terms. The language of Lean involves a whole lot of different things. I just picked a few top line items. So lean production is to optimize the value of goods and services by eliminating waste and increasing flow. So you keep the value chain moving. Just in time is one way of doing that in process redesign. Sometimes you need to redesign a process because it, the answer is why we do this, because we always have. To jump down to the value stream map, this is a picture is worth a thousand words. And I've done value stream maps in multiple different softwares to include PowerPoint. I created a value stream map of a, a literal screen one time to drive a project where I had a brick wall in the screen. I had salmon jumping over the brick wall going upstream and tributaries that went off the stream to the left and the right with production centers. And the value for that three years later is one, it was in a format that anybody can consume. It was PowerPoint. And then I took the PDF. Two, the visuals showed the salmon as a rework center coming back over the barriers, which means you're having to do it again and exactly where that happens. 
So there's value in the picture being a thousand words. So the value stream map is another tool. And then Kaizen is a philosophy of small continuous improvement. Doesn't always have to be batted over the fence for the big win. Little change over time adds up to big change. And it was first implemented in Japan uh, during World War II. And we've adopted a lot of those terms. So as we reviewed, there's a few principles of lean that we want to touch on. And it was to reduce pro uh, production waste, increase flow, reduce costs, and create value for your customers. At a bird's eye view, our lean techniques are both observational and technical. Um, so documentation, mapping is important under observational and under technical analysis, data collection and analysis of that data collection <coughs> so that you can provide course correction, right? It's so one thing to have observations and another thing to pair it with data so that it becomes viable information and models that people can make decisions on. So the eight forms of waste, quickly, are transportation, so going from here to there, waiting, overproduction, doing too much of it, defects, extra processing, so more signatures than you need, movement, and having too much inventory on hand. All cost money. And ultimately, it ends up in the area where you're wasting human potential and you shut down the conversation through it. So it's not just trash, or it's just trash, it is not recycling. Don't do it again. So a couple quick tools is that uh, you have know, A3 reporting. So it's a visual reporting system where you condense things, like we talked about that memo. Visual, a lot of times color coded. Uh, where you have the problem statement, what's the current state, what implementation actions, and the future state. So very concise, gets people on board. And some other techniques are Kanban, Pokio, and load leveling. And Gimbal Walk is basically uh, management by walking around, but documenting. So we want to make sure that we manage our cycle times, tack times, and theory of constraints so that we produce what is needed, when it's needed, and know about how long that takes. And then what are the bottlenecks in our process that are gonna slow us down and back us up, keeping us away from that goal of production. So push systems and pull systems. Um, it's always better to have a pull system because you have a levy to pull across Pushing is extremely difficult. So examples here is in our first stage of communication is pushing information to people, like group CCs. We all, we, I don't know that any of us too much care for that. But if information is supplied, it's undefined, and it's, it's not really scoped to exactly who it needs to go to oftentimes. The second step is making information easier to re relay and make it more clear of the modes and, and the, the, the message and the receiver that, that need the information, no matter what mode you take. The third one is having more coordinated exchange so you can deliver on schedule. And the third, fourth stage is flow, when it's needed. So if you have systems that have workflows, it's a lot like that. So pulling that all together, um, we've defined the, the process of communication, exchanging information, the methodology of lean, and lean communication is bringing them all together. So in our lean pursuit, we wanna make sure our objectives are clear and our strategies are clear. So our mission is to improve efficiency, reduce waste, and increase productivity. Our objectives might be the means of which we get there. The things to avoid is misunderstand uh, misunderstandings in your communication. And one of the terms I used was motogren, uh, the misheard lyrics 
when you've heard a song, you think they said that and they said something else, and you find out years later, you've been singing that song wrong for years, that also happens in our communication. So this diagram is just a system view of signals, making sure you have the right signals aligned with the right team that you've onboarded them properly. And you're measuring your cycle times, your change out times and where it's producing value. The five whys, gimbal walks and theory constraints come as you move through the process after onboarding. And then ultimately you get to the overall value production, the reason why you brought people on your team. And at each stage, you have A3 reporting to make sure you're on track. And the bottom tier is load leveling, where we look at making sure we're not over allocating people for meetings, uh, for other production related tasks, that you're not saying or doing too much or you're communicating things that are out of scope or tangential. So quickly, this graph is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and it was talking about the gap over the years between our labor and our productivity. And some of these over scheduling of meetings, over communicating a point, um, delayed understanding of points is part of that labor gap and that productivity gap. So if we apply some leaning principles, we might be able to retrieve and close the gaps from one year to another across the industries to make sure that we're doing meaningful meetings, meaningful communications. They actually lead somewhere. So on the way out the door, I want you to take this with you. A few tips is don't anticipate, ask. We spend a lot of time guessing about what people want and what they think. We should be a little bit more proactive and direct to reduce waste, so just ask. Done isn't always better than good. That's been a philosophy that I've kind of worked in reverse over years. I figured done is sometimes better than good, and a lot of times it was better than good. But for productivity, so you don't have to do it again, just to get off your checklist, done is not better than good. So watch that in your culture. Availability plus assignment does not equal alignment. Just because someone is available to do a task and they're assigned to do it, doesn't mean that they are the ones to do it, which means there could be overhead in the process from communicating expectations, deliverables, timelines, and waste is produced. And then when you run into some organizational challenges, I encourage you to take the stairs, so one step at a time, in your communication methods, but know where the elevator is. Sometimes there's just gonna be obstacles, and you need to be able to up-channel that to resolve the issue. And above all things, while you're communicating, stay positive. If you can only take one thing away from that, in the 17 to 25 percent, stay positive. This line is the one I would definitely say is the one you should invest your time in. But I appreciate your time. Um, I was blessed to be able to do this presentation. And at this point, we'll open up for questions. Well, thank you so much, Larry. That was an excellent presentation and so meaningful. I mean, it doesn't apply just to government. It applies to so many industries uh, across the board. Uh, if anyone has any questions or comments, uh, feel free to send them through the q and A. I'm going to pick up as many as I can that, that I see. Um, but uh, let me start with uh, one particular question uh, for you, Larry. Um, have you implemented a program of reducing and or improving meetings for perhaps a client or an organization? Uh, and if so, have you derived a return on investment from doing that? Um, I'm just kind of curious what what might have been the impact from from improving communication? Larry? Hello. 
Hello. Hello, Larry. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Um, I don't know what it went mute like. <laughs> um, yeah. So the the answer was I have implemented in part um, some some pilot programs for a couple of different organizations uh, to start with the eliciting of feedback from from their employees about meetings. So one of the part one of the tough parts about communication is whoever gives you have you you don't really get feedback on a regular day to day basis on what's that a productive use of your time. So um produce a, produce a, a few pilot programs and uh I actually have a presentation I was looking to do about using some uh, tools like Microsoft Forms on helping get that done. Great, great. Uh, there's another question that came in. Uh, the graph with time productivity, uh, it's in regards to this. What happened in quarter one of 2014 to drop productivity so much? Um, that's a good that's a good question. Um, I don't know what the event was that, that there, but I can look that up. Okay. All right. Um, uh, you got a number of comments, you know, indicating that this was a really effective and great presentation. Uh, here's a comment. I found the presentation very helpful and would like to promote efficiencies in my organization. I do find many of the meetings to be a waste of time, a wrong mix of resources. Decision makers are absent, lack of authority to approve ideas. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's a common one. Um, and that's where kind of getting back to uh, making sure that the right people are there. And that even comes with the decision makers, right? Mm -hmm. You could have the best plan in the world and everybody be on board, but if, if it can't be authorized, it can't be done. And uh, as you saw in those earlier slides, only 17% of senior managers and executives found meetings productive. So what does that mean for 83%? It means there's going to be a lot of people that aren't going to be participating and things slow down and cost money and have to be done again. Uh, here's another question for you, Larry. Um, how will artificial intelligence impact meetings? Oh my, that's a good one. All right, so, um, so I'll give you a, a light touch on this um, because I hope to present something in the not too far future around this. So there's some cities and some businesses that are using things like chatbots um, and combination of chatbots, um, social media, text explorers or uh, sensitivity analysis to be able to drill down the big data and uh, to get to what people are actually asking, what's actually important. But one big area is going to be chatbots. If you can get the answer without having the meeting, uh, in the supervised and unsupervised AI, as we feed these systems, the appropriate response would be less need to actually have the meetings, but we've got to get there. Thank you. Uh, another question here for you, Larry, is what are common strategies we can use to limit distraction in meetings? Well, one is an old school meeting uh, meeting technique. Stand up. <laughs> so there's stand up meetings um, and have an agenda. Don't just meet to meet. Have an agenda and don't write paragraphs, write bullet points. I tend to like to have bullet points and to get to about 30 minutes or less. Most of the time, meetings that go beyond that is overhead, and we're going to get into things that have nothing to do with why we came together. Fantastic. A um, couple other real quick announcements um, before everyone leaves. And uh, the uh, a PDF of this presentation, at least, will be available 
in the next couple of days on the website, on the government division website. Uh, also, stay tuned for additional webinars to come. Um, and I think you can also, you should be able to earn a, about point one uh, or use for those of you that are interested in applying it to a, uh, a certification. Um, well, one last question for you, Larry. Have you yep. tied specific performance metrics to meeting management or improved communications? Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, you can do a couple of different things. And what I was talking about was uh, something like a feedback tool. Whether it's paper um, or automated, have the participants at, at each level of the meeting. So manager, subject matter, expert, um, executive, rate the efficiency of the meeting. And you can do that in like those simple categories of, you know, it's excellent, good, fair, poor, you know, all that, and assign a point value to it. They don't need to see the point value. They just give you the feedback, and then that gives an overall effectiveness rating, which could be a metric that if you see time over time in a rolling wave, that the effectiveness is low. You can elicit feedback during that survey or in a small session to find out what's holding the efficiency back on these meetings. And it could, you could have things like, is it the number of meetings? Is it the length of meetings? Is it the facilitator? Makes, makes perfect sense. One more, one more question here. Do you find remote meetings more or less productive? Can you say it again? Do you find remote meetings more or less productive? So, Parkinson's Law again. <laughs> um, it, I, I feel they're more efficient. Now, effectiveness, well, you know, if, if you're not prepared, if you don't have the baseline together or you don't have the required attendees to actually make that effective, it'll be just as ineffective. So it's very efficient mode, but once again, that feedback from the participants is that you have to do this meeting again. Right. Well, Larry, I want to thank you. I mean, I think this was a fantastic presentation and, and clearly many other people did as well. And uh, absolutely. Um, and I hope everyone has a great afternoon or evening or morning where, wherever you may be. And, uh, and basically have a, have a great rest of your day. Thank you all.